Hello, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. Wishing you all an enjoyable listening experience. Today, we're delving into the measure of reality. We are incredibly familiar with the concept of measurement in our daily lives, it's almost second nature. Whether it's measuring dimensions for new furniture, tracking KPIs at month end, setting alarms, or dressing based on the weather, our every action is tied to quantifying reality. Have you ever pondered how, in contrast to tangible objects, concepts like centimeters, Celsius, stock market points, etc., would be expressed without specific numbers and scales? When did our world become so defined by measurements, and why are we so captivated by them? I'll hold off on answering that and introduce the author of this book, Alfred W. Crosby. You might have come across his other works, The Columbian Exchange and Ecological Imperialism, foundational texts in ecological history that influenced Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. Crosby, in these books, describes a series of biological exchanges between the old and new worlds after Columbus. For instance, maize, peppers, and potatoes made their way to Europe while sugarcane and coffee found their place in the Americas, altering ecologies and cultures worldwide. However, this exchange also led to devastating consequences like the introduction of smallpox by Europeans, decimating indigenous cultures, and the transfer of syphilis, an affliction that continues to affect us today. While writing these books, Crosby grappled with a question, how did Europeans, with advanced navigation techniques, precise ballistic calculations, and colonial expansion through joint stock companies, seemingly stay ahead, organizing resources and utilizing tools so efficiently? Traditionally, Textbooks simplify this as science and technology. But doesn't that feel like circular reasoning? Essentially stating that technological advancement propelled Europe forward and Europe's advancement indicates rapid technological growth. What was the driving force behind this technological advancement? Or as Crosby puts it, what sparked that match? This book presents Crosby's answer. He argues that the mania for measurement in industrial civilization originated in the West between 1250 and 1600, the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. During this time, Western society underwent a shift from mystical qualitative thinking to precise quantitative thinking. This crucial shift laid the foundation for future scientific and industrial revolutions, a transformation Crosby dubs the mental revolution. Next, the book is divided into two parts. The first explores the qualitative thinking prevalent in Europe before 1250, essentially examining the cognitive framework before the ignition of the mental revolution. To understand how the match of the mental revolution was lit, we must first understand what material comprised the matchstick. The second part discusses striking the match, the visualization of quantitative thinking, along with other catalysts, a series of technological innovations that made measurement possible. Part 1 to comprehend this mental revolution, we must first discuss the outdated mindset that was discarded. It's important to note that Europe's shift toward quantitative thinking doesn't imply a lack of understanding or concern for numbers before this transition. Contrarily, as far back as ancient Greece, figures like Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle regarded mathematics as the truth behind the order of the cosmos. For instance, Plato believed that the ideal population for a city-state should be 50-40, a number rooted in both perfect divisibility and auditory capabilities, Aristotle noted that approximately 5,000 individuals could hear an unaided voice simultaneously. However, neither Plato nor Aristotle offered concrete evidence supporting the precise number of 5,040. Plato's fascination with numbers stemmed from his belief that the real world was a mere reflection of the world of ideas. He deemed sensory perceptions unreliable and transient, while abstract concepts held permanence. Mathematics, being the purest form of abstraction with notions of squares, circles, and triangles, represented stability and precision. Aristotle, Plato's disciple, shared a similar sentiment but considered mathematics impractical. He argued that mathematicians had to disregard qualities like weight, heat, hardness, etc., perceivable qualities that are mutually exclusive, to measure the dimensions of the world. Oddly enough, these qualities are indeed measurable. However, Europeans of that era didn't perceive it this way. Unlike discrete tangible objects, qualities like hot-cold, hard-soft seemed more like continuous states rather than quantities. These sensory perceptions were considered rudimentary. 
While we now habitually segment reality into uniform units, such a perspective was alien during that time. This mysticism surrounding mathematics led to a dichotomy, practical techniques used for measuring reality were perceived as unrelated to the realm of mathematics. Concepts such as architectural engineering, observations for calendar making, market transactions involving weights and lengths, all utilized mathematics. However, for a considerable period, these practical applications remained divorced from the noble philosophical mathematics. Consequently, by the Middle Ages, European concepts of mathematics and measurement had diverged significantly. Despite the decline of ancient Greek and Roman philosophies, their mathematical concepts persisted. Measurement was largely seen as a craftsman's skill rather than applied mathematics, while mathematics itself became an appendage to theological cosmology. Let's start with measurement. The units of measurement during that era were not conceived based on mathematical understanding. Hence, many ancient units sound remarkably specific, even to an odd extent. For instance, the English unit of length, foot, derived from the length of a foot. However, for measuring land, another unit like the furlong, the distance a team of oxen could plow without resting, was used. Even the artisans constructing the intricate structures of Gothic cathedrals during the Middle Ages were well versed in geometric methods but focused only on practical applications without delving into deeper theoretical constructs. If asked about the geometric principles behind a certain cut of stone or wood, they would be at a loss. Now, let's consider mathematics. Around the 5th century AD, a theologian named St. Augustine, whose theological theories marked the beginning of the Middle Ages and served as a foundation for early Catholic doctrines, stated, we should not disdain the science of numbers. But how did he approach mathematics? He believed that God created the world in six days because the number six was perfect, it was the sum of his three factors, one, two, and three. The seventh day of rest was sacred because seven, the sum of the first odd number, three, and the first non-prime even number, four, held divine significance. This conceptualization persisted into the 13th century. St. Thomas Aquinas, a prominent scholar of that time, thought that the book of Revelation stipulating that only 144,000 people would be saved was due to the number's sacredness. 144 was the multiplication of Jesus' twelve disciples by the twelve tribes of Israel, while 1,000 represented 10 to the power of 3, the number of days between Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, thus, their product held divine significance. These theologians, reminiscent of Plato, regarded mathematics as a way of understanding abstract properties while disregarding sensory experiences of reality. Despite the emergence of later concepts in number theory examining relationships between numbers, their focus remained on the essence of each number in relation to the divine, seeking the most sacred and beautiful connections among these abstract concepts rather than interrelationships among numbers. This medieval European mindset mystified mathematics while trivializing measurements, resulting in a disconnect between the two realms of understanding. In this mindset, reality, as God's creation, shouldn't be measured by human standards. The differences in all things were considered inherent to their nature, and understanding these phenomena required grasping their fundamental properties. This outdated mindset led to what the author terms a historical sacred model, where time and space were human constructs determined by symbolic significance rather than absolute, uniform, quantifiable entities. The author reminds us that the common sense of each era varies, and our current understanding would have been inconceivable a millennium ago. Perhaps it might be hard to grasp, so let me give you a few examples. Take time, for instance. Nowadays, we all know a day consists of 24 hours, each equal in length. But medieval Europeans borrowed their timekeeping from the Middle East, believing that both day and night should comprise 12 hours each. The challenge arose, in Europe's high-latitude regions, most days and nights didn't align neatly into equal halves. So, the Europeans devised a flexible system similar to an accordion, ensuring 12-hour day and night periods for each season. Yet, these weren't our familiar units of time. So, how did they tell the time? Not by glancing at a clock or observing the sun's position but by listening to church bells tolling for prayer. Following the prevalent practice of seven prayer times a day, the bells chimed seven times, leaving people with intervals between bell tolls rather than a specific time. 
During Catholic fasting periods, eating was allowed after the ninth hour of prayer, this ninth hour referred to nine hours after sunrise. According to our calculation, if sunrise was at 6 a.m., the ninth hour should technically correspond to 3 p.m. However, to reduce fasting time during summer days, monks began tolling the bells earlier. Gradually, what was originally an afternoon hour became midday, signifying the ninth hour, knowns, in Latin, transforming into English is, noon. As for other hours, it was merely a matter of adjustment, pure operational convenience. This concept of time essentially aimed to symbolically align real time with theological needs. Similarly, their spatial perceptions followed suit. The prevalent geocentric and flat earth theories weren't just observational theories, they adhered to theological order. The geocentric theory posited that Earth was the center of the universe, surrounded by celestial spheres akin to an inverted fishbowl, rotating around us. The outermost celestial sphere housed heavenly bodies in perfect circular motion, as the concept of a circle embodied perfection. Earth, being the lowest realm, didn't adhere to perfect circles but rather elementary straight lines. Earth was depicted like a pie, divided by God into various regions corresponding to different life forms. When mapping, medieval maps didn't position north at the top but instead placed east at the map's zenith because it was believed Eden lay in the east. However, these maps weren't navigational tools based on geometric projections, they were more like artistic landscapes, often adorned with symbolic representations of creatures and saints. Concepts like scale or legend were irrelevant. Regarding mathematical concepts, Europeans for a long time weren't fond of precise numbers, they were content with terms like, a few, or, several months. Just a mention of Roman numerals from that era reveals how detrimental it was for mathematical advancement. Even now, many watches feature letters like I, V, X, which represent Roman numerals. Beyond these, Roman numerals include L, C, D, M, signifying 50, 100, 500, 1000 respectively. Placing a smaller numeral before a larger one meant subtraction, while after it meant addition, for instance, 6 for 6, 4 for 4. Now, how would one express a number like 1549? It would be written as Mc with the final, J, denoting the end of the number. Clearly, this Roman numeral system wasn't conducive to calculation. Consequently, calculations were made using manual methods and counting boards. Manual calculations involved using various hand gestures and formations to represent different numbers, as numbers grew, they employed arms, elbows, and even the belly button, thumbs pointing to the navel indicated 50,000. More complex computations often required counting boards, akin to abacuses, using beads to perform calculations. Shockingly, five centuries had passed in Europe without counting boards until the 10th century when clergy reintroduced Arabic numerals and counting boards from Islamic regions in southern Spain. To sum up, the qualitative thinking prevalent in medieval Europe characterized numbers as possessing moral and emotional value rather than being purely quantitative units. In the old European mindset, everything in the world held distinct qualities bestowed by God, rich with symbolic significance. Attempting to measure everything using human rational standards was seen as sacrilegious, not to mention, inconvenient. Part 2 – Why did Europe eventually abandon the ancient sacred models? Let's explore how the mentality revolution ignited. Let's start with the stroke of a match, the visualization, that made everything measurable, a popular mindset. Visualization refers to conveying information, charts, graphs, and more, through direct visual means. Consider the use of language and text. In earlier times, Europeans emphasized oral reading, only establishing library regulations for silence in the 15th century. The widespread availability of paper, pen, and ink coupled with improved literacy redirected the elite from oral traditions of gospel and epics to written records. Silent reading became the mainstream mode of knowledge acquisition. Even in today's audiobooks, you'll find tools like mind maps and transcripts, facilitating rapid information absorption. Additionally, there were two main expressions in art and commerce. In art, the perspective technique is familiar, but there's a less expected visual art form, music. Isn't music for listening? Here's where you'll see the significance of sheet music. In 7th century Europe, despite numerous religious chants, 
theologians feared music's demise as it couldn't be recorded. The chants relied on singers memorizing the melodies. Gregorian chants, versions of Catholic prayer texts in song, initially lacked precise notation for pitch, instead, they used shapes to indicate melodic pitch changes. By the 11th century, Guido of Arezzo in Italy promoted the use of musical staff notation, marking accurate pitch variations with equidistant lines. Guido named different pitches after the initial syllables of the popular chants, ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la, yes, the prototype of the modern scale. Post-Guido, musicians ventured into blending popular and religious music, introducing more voices into chants, creating polyphonic music. To notate complex voice harmonies, 13th-century musicians developed rhythmic notation, subdividing time into uniform units, enabling readers to discern each note's duration. Consequently, even Beethoven, despite being deaf, could compose intricate symphonies. The Church, perceiving music as a form to convey divinity, lamented the shift from divine reverence to human glorification of composers. In 1322, the Church band corrupted polyphonic music, yet secular venues and courtyards were already flourishing with new music composed using the novel notation. Sheet music wasn't just perhaps Europe's earliest standardized chart, it showcased human rationality's control over time. Meanwhile, spatial representation emerged in painting. Medieval art often depicted various events in a single frame without perspective, positioning and sizing figures based on their significance, devoid of spatial reflection, focusing purely on symbolism. With advancements in optics and geometry, artists realized they could portray space using perspective. Though the subjects remained religious, perspective transformed painting into imitation of real-world space. 13th-century artist Giotto excelled in creating large-scale frescoes, using perspective to grant viewers a sense of physical depth. Artists calculated proportions meticulously to depict where and how large figures or objects should be based on distance. Artists morphed into mathematicians and masters of geometry. Both painting and music experienced significant expansion from 1250 to 1600. The reasons are familiar, the rise of capitalism introduced numerous emerging bourgeoisie, investing in revolutionary art. How they earned money connected to the mentality revolution. Enter the bookkeepers and accountants. The highly monetized economy made price recording easier, yet fluctuating currency values and credit methods for long-distance trade disrupted payment sequences, complicating merchant bookkeeping. Earlier, accounting narrated a product's entire journey, sometimes detailing incidental conversations. A new method emerged, double-entry bookkeeping, where each transaction was recorded in parallel in asset and liability columns, maintaining equilibrium. Venice, as Europe's busiest port, extensively employed double-entry bookkeeping, making the Venetian method synonymous with double-entry bookkeeping. Coincidentally, this city also became a hub for public lectures on algebra. Luca Pasiali, revered as the father of accounting, studied mathematics in Venice, refining the existing double-entry bookkeeping with mathematical principles. Pasiali, a monk and a mathematician, was a close friend of da Vinci. He authored Summa de Arithmetica, asserting that architecture, astrology, military strategy, theology, and more were essentially mathematics, including perspective and music. The book's practical highlight. It explained the operation of double-entry bookkeeping clearly. Pasiali recommended a daily assessment of assets, maintaining three types of accounts, memos, journals, ledgers, and marking them with the Holy Cross to ward off evil. These ledgers were akin to capturing a long storm in a photo, vividly illustrating every raindrop's position and direction. Quantities in positive and negative, goods out and in at different times, all balanced out eventually. The bourgeoisie learned a vital lesson from double-entry bookkeeping, everything is measurable, and everything requires measurement. Through examples like sheet music, perspective techniques, and double-entry bookkeeping, these visualizations gradually made quantitative thinking dominate senses. Mathematics invaded reality, becoming the sole means of understanding and controlling it. In essence, through quantifiable means, the sacred significance of reality faded, and straightforward visualization made quantification the most popular method of controlling reality. Around 1250, Europe's old models began to shift rapidly, with quantitative thinking gaining dominance. 
this match's ignition had many accelerants. Independent cities and small states in medieval Europe provided havens for various ideologies. Early universities emerged, gathering scholars dedicated to research, necessitating the organization of vast manuscripts using more rigorous methods. They invented indexing systems, chapter titles, and page headers, organizing texts systematically and enabling easy retrieval. Many scholastic philosophers realized that poetic and symbolic language couldn't suffice, they needed rigorous logical language to clarify thoughts. They began using mathematics to describe God's creation, signaling the inception of quantitative thinking. Moreover, as commerce and trade flourished, Europe entered the era of a cash economy but faced a lack of hard currency in precious metals, a predicament studied by theologians. A monk named Orzma in the 14th century discovered that reducing the gold content in coins increased their quantity, leading to currency depreciation, causing impoverishment, a principle echoing inflation and the bad driving out the good. Merchants began employing the concept of accounting currency, establishing an ideal measure to determine exchange rates between different currencies. Through currency, every commodity started having a price derived from measurement, even time, which began having a price, interest. Under the impact of visualization and new technology, old models began to crack, if time could be measured with numbers, what couldn't? Yet, to truly ignite the mentality revolution, accelerants were needed from time, space, and mathematics, providing tools to measure everything. First, let's talk about time. During this period, Europeans refined the Julian calendar inherited from ancient Rome, aligning human time with astronomical time, creating the widely used Gregorian calendar. The reason behind this reform wasn't purely astronomical but for Easter. The Church mandated Easter as the first Sunday after the first full moon following the vernal equinox. However, due to the Julian calendar's deviation from the solar year, with too many leap years, by 1582, the Julian calendar lagged behind by eleven days. Troubled by this discrepancy, Pope Gregory XIII made a controversial decision, adopting the adjusted new calendar and skipping forward eleven days, the present-day Gregorian calendar. Many devout believers found it hard to accept this reform, time standards were now based on celestial bodies rather than theological doctrines. The more fundamental change, however, was in hours. As mentioned earlier, medieval Europe used church bells to mark time, similar to China, but in Europe, the bells were controlled by churches. Hours were irregular, dividing the day into segments based on prayer times. At night, when there were no bell tolls, astronomers needed to record planetary movements, monks had to prepare for evening prayers, how would they manage? If the sky was cloudy, obscuring the sun and moon positions, telling time became challenging. People required a clock that could accurately signal sacred moments for prayer anytime. With ancient Greek and Roman timekeeping tools lost, medieval Europeans mostly used candles, hourglasses, water clocks, which were inadequate for monks. Around the 13th century, an ingenious solution emerged from a European monastery, the mechanical clock. At the heart of these clocks was the escapement mechanism, regulating the movement of the device in a fixed rhythm. For instance, pendulum clocks used a fixed swinging motion to drive an anchor, controlling gears to produce ticking sounds. The earliest mechanical clocks were gravity-driven, installed on tall towers, enabling the entire city to hear the bells. By 1335, a chapel in Milan already had a 24-hour mechanical clock that struck the number of hours. Scholars at the time praised this clock, saying it knew what specific hour each strike meant, which was most necessary for all human life and work. The advent of mechanical clocks introduced a new model for understanding the world. Orams, who discovered inflation, likened God's creation of the world to making a clock, setting it in motion to continue running on its own. Moreover, as more cities erected clock towers with mechanical devices, citizens organized their lives around these new sounds. The ticking of the escapement, along with musical beats, propagated the notion of a uniform, divisible world. Peter Lark, the father of humanism, said, Life moves forward at a constant pace without pause or retreat. We forge ahead, come what may, be it easy or hard, short or long, the consistent element is a constant speed. Rationality thus tamed time. Innovations in spatial understanding were slower but centered on two major theories, latitude and longitude and heliocentrism. 
Earlier European maps were typically two maps, with a T-shaped water body at the center, depicting Europe in the lower left, Africa in the lower right and Asia above, with Jerusalem at the intersection. The advent of the compass from the east simplified maritime navigation. By the late 13th century, sailors started using the Portolan chart, which represented land directions. This chart primarily outlined coastlines and ports, using radial lines to indicate directions, albeit limited to the Mediterranean and nearby seas. However, around 1400, Ptolemy's geography from the Eastern Roman Empire reached Europe, introducing the concept of a spherical earth and grid maps. Navigators now realize the theoretical basis for discrepancies between theory and practice. Cartographers could establish coordinates based on celestial positions, applying a grid across the Earth's surface, what we now know as latitude and longitude. They also understood the need for geometric corrections to project the curved Earth onto a flat map, similar to principles in painting perspective. When Spain and Portugal began their colonial endeavors at the end of the 15th century, the Pope proposed that the boundary for the two countries' colonization be determined by 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, measured in degrees. This acceptance of dividing space using coordinates was evident. Simultaneously, the maritime industry spurred astronomical observations. Observing from ships, Orem raised a question, how could one ascertain the Earth's stillness and the Sun's motion? Although he posed this query in the mid-14th century, he lacked sufficient mathematical knowledge. Two centuries later, Copernicus used precise mathematics to argue the heliocentric model, displacing Earth from the center of the universe, publishing On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, in 1543. This work not only supported heliocentrism but, for the first time in a millennium, described astronomy using mathematics. He calculated the distant stars needed to appear stationary during Earth's motion, presenting a new, expansive cosmic view. Later, Bruno, burned at the stake in 1600, was persecuted not only for supporting Copernicus but also for suggesting an infinite void beyond Earth, a uniformly structured space. We've discussed how mathematical progress enabled Copernicus to write, on the revolutions, and simplified double-entry bookkeeping. We've mentioned Orem's idea in the 14th century of needing invisible points, lines, and planes for measuring continuous quantities. However, using fingers and counting boards for calculations was challenging, not to mention recording them using Roman numerals. Fortunately, Arabs came to the rescue with the translation of the works of the Arabian mathematician Al-Khwarizmi into Latin in the 12th century, introducing Indian Arabic numerals to Europe. These new digits were simple, clear, capable of expressing any number using ten symbols, perfectly suited to the decimal system, yet Europeans took time to adapt. With no concept of zero previously, Europeans thought of it merely as a symbol for carrying over rather than a number. They mixed Roman numerals, like MCCCC 94 for 1494. New arithmetic symbols emerged, such as the addition and subtraction signs of a cross and a horizontal line in 1489. Before that, People described operations using words or letters, representing unknowns, marking decimals differently, among other methods. In summary, mathematics gradually detached from language, transitioning to symbols, one became one, existing beyond nature, stable. By the late 16th century, Johannes Kepler, who proposed the three laws of planetary motion, believed that God created the universe using mathematics, implying that humans and God used the same rationality for understanding. He wrote, apart from numbers and magnitudes, human thought has nothing else. To sum up, between 1250 and 1600, clocks and calendars divided time into precise, calculable units, latitude, longitude, and heliocentrism transformed space into uniform, calculable geometries. These new perceptions of time and space corresponded to new music and art, while Arabic numerals facilitated mathematical symbolization, simplifying accounting. Human rational thinking was poised to measure everything. Closing this discussion, we've gained a general understanding of the mental revolution in Europe between 1250 and 1600. As we all know, the saying, time is money, is attributed to Benjamin Franklin, a founding father and great scientist, in 1748. As we've just explored, money has uniform units, whereas time was once akin to an accordion. The equation formed between these two, thanks to the mental revolution. 
reality was segmented into equal units, visualized as an image, measured mathematically. The universe was no longer complex or lofty, practicality triumphed over the sacred. More bourgeoisie gained secular power. As Gutenberg's printing press became widespread, people could read about cannonball trajectories, oceanic navigation routes, human muscle compositions, precisely visualized using mathematical methods. As Galileo said, the universe is written in the language of mathematics, its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric shapes. Without these, humans couldn't understand a single word in this great book of the universe, without these, people would only wander in a dark maze. The unique mindset established by Europeans during this phase combined mathematics and measurement, significantly enhancing their control and organizational capabilities in reality. These developments laid the foundation for scientific and industrial revolutions and persist in the mindset of everyone living in modern society. The next time you listen to music or fill out an Excel spreadsheet, you might reflect on how you're still illuminated by a match ignited over 700 years ago. There you have it, the complete content as introduced to you. Congratulations on finishing another book. Thank you all for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom with practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you, goodbye.